Welcome to yet another video tutorial by Synapse. In continuation with the blood malignancy series, topic for today's tutorial is chronic myeloid leukemia. So let's begin. CML, right? So C stands for chronic. So in the last lecture, it was made clear that chronic refers to the neoplastic proliferation of the mature cells, okay, mature WBCs. So M stands for myeloid, so we're talking about the myeloid series and L is leukemia, that is malignant cells in the bone marrow and spilling into blood, okay, cool. Um, now let's look at the average age at which we have CML. So AML we studied that it was around, uh, okay, talking about age, for AML it was around 67 years, right? 67 years. So we remembered it as 50 to 60 years, right? Now, what about CML? CML appears, it occurs at a younger age, okay? Relatively um, at a younger age. So here it is around 47 years, right? So as you see here, it is kind of less than 50 years. Okay, relatively earlier than uh, AML. So again, the sex predilection males more than females, right? Okay, um, we'll go into the risk factors. So let's talk in the similar fashion uh, as we did for AML. So first we spoke about environmental factors. So just for a recap, so there we spoke about smoking, uh, radiation exposure, exposure to benzene, and drugs, drugs like alkylating agents and etoposide. So what about CML then? Here the only risk factor that you need to remember is radiation. Okay, that too, exposure to extreme high dose radiation. So the other factors that we studied in AML, uh, they, they don't hold good for CML, okay? So the second factor we studied there, uh, was the hematological conditions, correct? So we studied uh, under the headings of acquired and congenital hematological conditions. So the only thing that uh, you need to remember here is acquired, okay? Acquired hematological conditions, that is myeloproliferative disorders, okay? Myeloproliferative disorders. Fine, so MPS was made quite clear in the last lecture, myeloproliferative uh, disorders or syndrome. We said there are four diseases, right? So what were they? One related to your RBCs, one related to WBCs, one related to platelets. The other one was uh, due to the cytokine effect. Okay, cytokine released by platelets. So RBC, so that was polycythemia, vera. WBCs, CML, disease of the platelets that is essential thrombocytosis and uh, here it was myelofibrosis that is primary myelofibrosis. Okay, fine. Now what is clear, okay, from the pattern in which we are trying to remember MPD? M stands for myeloid, sorry, rather myelo, okay. So that refers to the marrow, okay. So all these precursor cells are present in the marrow, okay. So one point regarding MPD is that, so any form, okay, one form of MPD can convert into another form of MPD, okay. So what do I mean? So if the patient has essential thrombocytosis, he could get converted into CML. So hence, it forms a risk factor for the development of CML, okay? So it is a, it is an acquired hematological condition, okay? Fine. So that's it. So now let's move on to the pathogenesis, okay? This is pretty important and most of you know about this. Okay. So one thing that you shouldn't forget regarding CML is the concept of 
Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, the concept of Philadelphia chromosome. Um, okay, so you guys also know that it refers to 922 translocation. Okay, it refers to translocation 922. Now, if I ask someone, okay, what is Philadelphia chromosome? Okay, what is the answer? If you're saying it is translocation 922, sorry, you're wrong. Okay, so then see, it's there in the name. So I'm I'm looking at a chromosome. Okay, you need to give the answer in the in terms of numbers. Okay, it is chromosome number this, right? So what is the answer then? So answer is chromosome number 22. Okay, so this is Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, so as you see the pathogenesis further, it will become clearer. Okay, fine. So now you need to we need to draw two chromosomes chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 okay so let's say this is chromosome 9 this is chromosome 22 okay logically 9 is bigger than 22 why because in karyotype okay what happens the bigger chromosomes are in the beginnings right so that's why that's how we name it right so 9 is obviously bigger than 22 now on chromosome number 9, we have a gene, okay, that is called as the ABL gene, okay, and then on chromosome 22, let's use a different color here, we have gene that is BCR, okay, so now what happens here is that you have a balanced reciprocal translocation okay so this term is pretty important balanced reciprocal translocation so what really happens is this AB the ABL gene right so it will shift okay it will come to lie here okay so as a result what happens if this is your chromosome 22 fine so we have the BCR part and we also have the ABL part here, right? So both the genes are lying close to each other. Now, and 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 if you can look here, some part of this normal uh, chromosome, okay, this part will get shifted here. Okay, that's why it is reciprocal. Okay. Now, if you can see, this is the resultant chromosome we have got, right? So this is chromosome 22. What is the difference between this chromosome, okay, and this chromosome? It appears shorter, correct? So, this shorter chromosome 22 is called Philadelphia chromosome. Got it? Okay, that is the concept of Philadelphia chromosome. Now, there is a catch here that needs to be made very clear. Okay, this is the point. See, rearrangement of the BCR region on chromosome 22 is seen in 100% CML cases. Okay, as in this rearrangement is happening in 100% cases. But, what is the catch? But, Philadelphia chromosome is seen only in 95% patients. Now it's clear, right? It's just the presence of shorter, the shortened uh, chromosome 22 that is referred to as Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, it is not really telling you about the translocation, right? So, but 100% of patients uh, with CML will have this rearrangement. Okay, so that is to be kept in mind. Fine. So what happens? Okay, okay. Let's just go back. And have a look at this right so we, we are looking at this region which is the composite part right so you have the BCR part also and the ABL part also so this will transcribe and produce what is called as your BCR ABL BCR ABL tyrosine kinase okay this is a protein right so this is the one which is responsible for increased proliferation of your mature WBCs. 
okay so now we understood the pathogenesis so why is this useful because if I tackle this okay so I can control the disease right so now let's um, go into the clinical features because pathogenesis is pretty clear so let, let's look at clinical features okay so again imagine a 45 47 year old male patient okay who is having increased number of mature WBC in the circulation right now uh, before we decipher before we understand the clinical features let's again just look into this okay the terminology we said chronic chronic means mature cells right so marrow has the immature cells so that means okay the mature cells as soon as they are formed they come into the blood correct so they are not occupying the space in the marrow so hence there is place for the development of the other lineages right so we have w, uh, the rbc's developing we have development of the platelets okay so hence we don't see the picture of pancytopenia okay that because that was the feature of aml okay in cml that is not the case fine so if you see the uh, actually if you see the total leukocyte count will be raised okay the total leukocyte count is elevated why because mature cells are increased right so that is the point so usually it is more than 2 lakh per microliter okay so this is the usual picture not always but if it's present it's very characteristic counts more than 2 lakh now let's talk about the platelets so we said there is place for the platelets to grow so they will also increase and it's also part of mps there could be a component of myeloproliferative syndrome also so platelet count is also more so usually more than 4 lakh 50 thousand okay so rather it is thrombocytosis fine okay so then uh, what about rbc's so initially you will not have any uh, feature associated with rbc's but later on what happens is again the culprit is the cytokines right so cytokines produced from the platelets will suppress your um, rbc production hence they can have anemia and very it is like mild to moderate grade it's not very severe will have mild to moderate now if you see all of these features so there is no reason for the uh, for the patient to come to us right so hence the most common presentation in CML is asymptomatic, right? So they will not have any features, fine. So the second most common uh, presenting feature would be uh, anemia, right? Basically fatigue. Due to anemia, they will have fatigue and weakness, okay? That's totally possible. Now. See, I keep going back to this point that it's mature cell because you can derive everything and understand everything about the disease just based on this basic concept. See, mature cells, right? So they are the ones, again, which are releasing cytokines, right? So hence, I had mentioned one point in the last lecture. It was about B symptoms, okay? B symptoms. So that will be fever, um, weight loss okay so all of these features are more in cml okay so they can also have b symptoms okay fine now mature cells right so they're coming into blood they they're going into the circulation what they'll do is they like to settle elsewhere so where do they settle here they go into spleen so another important feature of cml is splenomegaly okay they'll have massive splenomegaly okay very very important now um just a question here to the audience will these patients have lymph adenopathy okay Will they have lymphadenopathy because the mature cells are coming into circulation so they could settle right and they're settling in the spleen they could go into liver can they go into the lymph nodes the answer is no because see the term it is a cml it's a myeloid series okay the lymphoid series are the ones which go and rest in the lymph nodes okay and which can cause disease in the lymph nodes 
So basically myeloid will not cause disease of the lymph node, right? So that is very simple point, logical, but at times might confuse. Uh, okay, another clinical feature here to be kept in mind is look at this TLC. It's extremely high. It's like more than 2 lakhs. So what happens? Okay, it will increase the viscosity see platelets are high total count is high okay so it can cause what is called hyper viscosity syndrome okay so the patient can have headache blurring of vision and things like that fine uh, okay there's no place here but I would want to add one more thing regarding the clinical feature that would be gouty arthritis okay so uh, again in CML the count is high the turnover will also be high so the WBCs the mature WBCs are undergoing degradation so what will happen again there will be increase in uric acid but unlike AML AML is all acute setting right so there will be sudden increase in uric acid which will go clog the tubules the renal tubules causing uric acid uh, nephropathy but here there is a chronic and uh, sustained increase in the uric acid so which will go into the joints okay and it will present more like a chronic feature of increased uh, uric acid in blood that would be gouty arthritis rather than acute manifestation such as nephropathy okay so now let us just go into the diagnosis part. So clinical features is done. So how will you diagnose? So like what we had studied earlier for AML, first we would do the morphology studies, right? So you can study your peripheral smear or you can study your marrow. Okay, now I'll, let's just have a look at our peripheral smear here right so what can we see if you can remember what we saw in AML right so we, we, we saw like the myeloblast right so we know how it looks it is just large cell very big nucleus okay um, or rods and granules and stuff like that but now if you see okay the cells they look very very different okay some can see here some have very big nucleus okay look at that and some have like segmented nucleus okay look here okay and this look like band forms right so basically what does it mean that here the WBCs okay they have reached uh, they, they, they have basically different morphology as in it is towards the mature spectrum okay that's what we see fine so that is how it appears on the peripheral smear so we have done the morphology okay um, next what happens the very very most important component in diagnosing CML is the search for your chromosome okay so how do you find out the chromosome as I told you already, it's karyotyping. So we're going to do the karyotyping and gene banding, G banding, right? So you're going to find for that um, the chimeric gene, BCR ABL. Okay. Now, what was the point that was mentioned? Only 95% of patients will have Philadelphia chromosome positivity. Okay. Now, can we miss those five percent patients obviously not so what do we do we know that in hundred percent cases we have the translocation or the rearrangement correct so how do you find for this so you just do in your peripheral smear you measure the levels of the bcr abl transcripts okay as in the number of cells which are carrying this um, transcript basically the mutated protein right so that is what we do on peripheral smear so most of them you will pick it up around 100 percent people will have this people with cml so you can pick it up fine 
now what is another importance of doing this okay looking for the bcr abl transcripts see once you start treatment what happens the these levels the transcript levels will decrease so it is going to tell you about the response to the therapy okay fine um now let's go into the treatment part let's just see how to treat this okay okay so um as as was told in aml okay we should again prevent tumor lysis syndrome fine uh, how do we how do we search for this how do we know that there is risk we are going to measure the ldh levels okay if it's high that means the patient is at risk for developing tls so what would you do then so to prevent this it is already told so you're going to reduce uric acid production and you're going to give aggressive fluid therapy to wash it off to reduce uric acid we can start the patient on allopurinol or fibuxostat okay then uh, the other one okay there's another drug here that is to be mentioned that is hydroxyurea so what does this do this will reduce the cell counts okay so hence it has a role in CML because I told you total count is like more than 2 lakhs so first reduce the cell counts okay and then we will go into the treatment proper okay so this is to prevent TLS okay fine um, how do we treat CML I'll take a different slide because this is extremely important one drug that you have to remember is imatinib what is a drug imatinib now I think most of you guys have heard about this drug but you should know something more than what most of them know right so what is this this is tyrosine kinase inhibitor correct makes sense because in pathology we had seen that there is uh, BCR ABL tyrosine kinase that is mutated tyrosine kinase right so it will keep itself activated for a longer time hence we had increased multiplication correct now if you use an inhibitor right so you can control the disease so the drug is imatinib fine now I'm going to give here I'm going to write a protocol okay that is to be seen first okay patient uh, with CML okay so we know that there could be two possibilities 95% have this Philadelphia chromosome positivity or it could be negative so they will anyway so both of them will have transcripts positive okay this is the third time I'm highlighting so that's how important it is to understand now what do you start here we're going to start the patient on imatinib and there's going to be really good response to this drug okay it's a very good very good drug actually um, here uh, what happens is that you can start the patient on imatinib but the response rate is not so good okay so not uh, not a good response okay so you won't be satisfied so here no you have to go with uh, allogenic bone marrow transplant to go for bone marrow transplant fine now let's just talk about imatinib so we know the mechanism of action so I told it is going to be acting on the tyrosine kinase uh, uh, receptor and going to inhibit it so where does it exactly bind so it binds to the place where ATP binds okay basically the ATP binding site on tyrosine kinase okay now how do we start uh, this drug so the dosage is going to be um, 400 400 mg per day okay so how much are we going to use we're going to use 400 mg per day that's the starting dose fine let's say if we start the drug as soon as you start the drug what is the most the earliest uh, adverse effect the earliest 
adverse effect is going to be the GI disturbance. Okay, GI disturbance. That's going to be your nausea, vomiting, and such features. So if you use it for a long term, okay, uh, then the side effect is going to be edema. So the patient is going to be all puffed up. Okay, there'll be generalized edema in this patient. Okay, fine. So this drug is first generation tyrosin kinase inhibitor. So then logically there will be more to this that is second generation and third generation. So what are the drugs under uh, second generation? We have nilotinib and dasatinib. Third generation we have bosutinib and we have ponatinib okay fine so now when they're second and third generation that means there's some condition where your first generation fails right so that is when there is resistance okay to imatinib that happens when there is a mutation in the um, drug binding site right so tyrosine kinase domain mutation occurs okay so hence the drug cannot sit there anymore so there won't be any action of the drug so once imatinib is not uh, the patient is not responding to imatinib we go to second and we can start the patient second generation and then we move on to third generation if that is also not uh, responding now how do you know that the patient is responding how do you know that your treatment is working okay so there will be factors that you have to look at, right? So we have to look at the hematological features, then we will go into the molecular features and we will see the cytogenic features. So what is the hematological feature? See on peripheral smear, so what did we see in peripheral smear? TLC was high, platelets were increased, correct? And uh, symptomatically the patient had uh, beta, B, the B symptoms and all. So uh, after starting imatinib so within two weeks okay within two weeks your peripheral smear what happens TLC will reduce okay it will kind of normalize the platelet counts will also come back to normal and the signs and symptoms will reduce signs and symptoms will reduce okay so this all of this happens within the first two weeks of starting the treatment now molecular okay what happens is again peripheral smear you're going to measure the trans transcript levels right so here now it will become um, undetectable undetectable by PCR right so this uh, happens by three months that means the treatment is adequate and the patient is response uh, is responsive cytogenic Right, here we are going to check for the Philadelphia chromosome. So, we are going to take the marrow biopsy, okay, and uh, we are going to check for the presence of the Philadelphia chromosome. This will clear by six months. So, all of it becomes negative, fine? Okay, now you are happy. You are like, okay, the patient is responding, everything fine. But one thing that you will have to tell the patient that imatinib treatment or rather your tyrosine kinase treatment is lifelong like your HIV drugs okay even uh, the treatment for CMR okay that has to be continued right it's lifelong that's the sad part but then there's excellence response to the treatment that's the happy part of it okay um, now whatever we discussed so far regarding CMR okay that was the chronic phase okay chronic phase now if you study the evolution of the disease right so it, it will ultimately go to the blast phase right so this behaves exactly like your AMR okay blast okay remember we had studied okay uh, acute so immature cells will increase so all of that will happen so basically that is nothing but your AMR so this intermediate step is called as the accelerated phase it's called the accelerated phase 
Now, what are the features that are suggestive of transformation of CML into blast phase, right? So you should see the features of accelerated phase. What are they? See, suddenly your um, counts will go on increasing. So your blast count will increase, correct? Okay. So your blasts will increase, fine? Okay. Then, uh, and feature of AML was, uh, you remember pancytopenia, right? So here when blast increase again, they will take over the marrow, so your other cells will go on reducing. So you will have anemia, which is mo mild there, now it will become obvious, right? So anemia sets in, platelet counts will reduce, um, okay, from thrombocytosis, it becomes thrombocytopenia, okay? So these will be the features. So blast, you can remember, it will be around 10 to 20 percent. So if it goes beyond 20 percent, you know it's clear AML, right? Okay, and again features of pancytopenia. So these are danger signs. And then you should also remember, very important here, are the basophil counts. Okay, so basophil. Normally, you don't see basophils in the peripheral smear, but if you see basophils, that means it's a, uh, it's like CML transforming into blast phase and it's a very bad sign, okay? Um, fine. So that's about this. And how do we treat if the patient is, okay, coming to you, okay, and now he's already in the accelerated phase. What can you do about it? Same thing, start imatinib. But here the response was very good. Here it will it will be around less than 40%. Only less than 40% patients respond to your treatment. Okay, that is with retardation kinase inhibitor. So what do you do again? You should go with the bone marrow transplant. Okay, fine. Now blast phase. Okay, this treatment is just like how you treat AML and along with it add imatinib. How do you treat AML? If you just remember from the last lecture, it is 7 plus 3 regime. So we're going to use 7 days of cytarabin. Okay, and 3 days of donorubicin. Okay. okay, that's it. So that's pretty much um, everything about CML that you should know. Uh, something that okay you should that you should like keep in mind here would be regarding the Philadelphia chromosome and treatment with uh, imatinib and the patient would be an elderly male, basically around uh, forty years, forty to fifty years presenting with fever and massive splenomegaly this should cml should be included in the uh, differentials okay so thank you for watching this video and um, so next up let's take uh, all and uh, cll thank you